the science progress via paradigm shifts and uh, revolutions, as philosopher Thomas Kuhn said, or does it progress gradually? What do you think? Well, I got into this field because I was Tom Kuhn's research assistant 50 years ago, 52 wow. years ago. Really? He pulled me into it out of physics instead. So I know his work pretty well. And in the years when I was at MIT running an institute, he was then in the philosophy department, used to come over all the time to the talks we held and so on. So what would I say about that? He, of course, developed his ideas a lot over the years. Yes. The thing that he's famous for, the <laughs> structure of scientific revolutions, came out in 62. And um, as you just said, it offered um, an outline for what he called a paradigmatic structure, namely the notion that <laughs> you have to look at what scientists do as forming a community of investigators and that they're trying to solve various puzzles, as he would put it, that crop up, figuring out how this works, how that works, and so on. And of course, they don't do it out of the blue. They do it within a certain framework. The framework can be pretty vague. He called it a paradigm. And his notion was that eventually they run into troubles, or what he called anomalies. That kind of cracks things. Somebody new comes along with a different way of doing it etc. Do I think things work that way? No, not really. Tom and I used to have lengthy discussions about that over the years. Um, I do think there is a common structure that formulates both theoretical and experimental practices. Mm -hmm. And historians nowadays of science like to refer to scientific work as what scientists practice. It's uh, almost craftsmanlike. They can usually adapt in various ways. Uh, and I can give you all kinds of examples of that. I once wrote a book on the origins of wave theory of light, and that is one of the paradigmatic examples that Tom used, only it didn't work that way exactly because he thought that what happened was that the um, – Wave theory ran into trouble with a certain phenomenon, which it couldn't crack. Mm -hmm. Well, it turned out that, in fact, historically, that phenomenon was actually um, not relevant uh, later on to the wave theory. And when the wave theory came in, uh, the alternative to it, which had prevailed, which was Newton's views, light as particles, that, it seemed, couldn't explain what the wave theory could explain. Again, not true. Not true. It's much more complex than that. The wave theory offered the opportunity to deploy novel experimental and mathematical structures, which gave younger scientists, mathematicians and others, the opportunity to effect, manufacture, make new sorts of devices it's not that the alternative couldn't sort of explain these things, but it never was able to generate them de novo as novelties. In other words, if you think of it as something scientists want to progress in the sense of finding new stuff to solve, mm -hmm. then I think what often happens is, is that it's not so much that the prevailing view can't crack something as that it doesn't give you the opportunity to do new stuff. When you say new stuff, are we referring to experimental science here or new stuff in the space of uh, new theories? Could be both. Could be both, actually. So how does that, can you maybe elaborate a little bit on the story of the wave view? Sure. Of the prevailing view of light, at least in France, where the wave theory really first took off, although it had been introduced in England by Thomas Young, the prevailing theory dates back to Newton, that light is a stream of particles. And that refraction and reflection involve sort of repulsive and attractive forces that deflect and bend the paths of these particles. <laughs> Newton was not able successfully to deal with the phenomenon of what happens when light goes past a knife's edge or a sharp edge, what we now call diffraction. Uh, he had he cooked up something about it that no mathematical structure could be applied. Um, Thomas Young first, but really this guy named Augustin Fresnel in France, deployed 
in Fresnel's case, rather advanced calculus forms of mathematics, which enabled computations to be done and observations to be melded with these computations in a way that you could not do or see how to do with Newton. Did that mean that the Newtonian explanation of what goes on in diffraction fails? Not really. You can, you can actually um, make it work, but you can't generate anything new out of it. Whereas, using the mathematics of wave optics in respect to a particular phenomenon called polarization, which ironically was discovered by partisans of Newton's way of doing things, you were able to generate devices which reflect light in crystals, do various things that the Newtonian way could accommodate only after the fact. They couldn't generate it from the beginning. And so if you want to be uh, somebody who is working a novel vein, which increasingly becomes the case with uh, people who become what we now call physicists in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s in particular, then that's the direction you're going to go. But there were holdouts until the 1850s. I want to try to elaborate on the nature of the disagreement you have with Thomas Kuhn. So do you still believe in paradigm shifts? Do you, do you, do you still see that there is ideas that really have a transformational effect on science? You just The nature of the disagreement has to do with how those paradigm shifts come to be? how they come to be and how they change. I certainly think they exist. How strong they may be at any given time is maybe not quite as powerful as Tom thought in general, although towards the end of his life, he was beginning to develop uh, different uh, modifications mm -hmm. of his original way of thinking. Uh, but I don't think that the changes happen quite so uh, neatly, if you will in reaction to um, novel experimental observations. They get much more complex than that. 